Diamonds are the most prestigious of all gems. Originally the domain of royalty, diamonds bring glamour, sophistication and class. But diamonds are so rare in nature, they don't come cheap. This is the classic 10 carat uh, emerald cut, which uh, I'm sure every woman would love to own, and that's around $650,000. But how would you feel if you could get your hands on top quality merchandise for a fraction of the price? We're not talking about fakes, but diamonds grown in a lab. Synthesizing diamonds had been a holy grail. For physicists, for chemists, for 200 years people had tried to make diamonds and they had failed. The possibility of being able to mass produce high quality diamonds has sent shockwaves through the multi-billion dollar diamond industry. What if there is a way to synthesize diamonds that are non-detectable from natural diamonds? What if technology gives us the ability to make a synthetic diamond that no one knows is synthetic? This is the story of the diamond makers and how one day these fabulous gemstones may become available to us all. On the outskirts of Boston, hidden away in a secret lab, a father and son team were hoping to become fabulously rich. They were trying to grow in their laboratory the most valuable gemstone known to man. No one knew if it would work. Following growth, you always put the diamond into a, uh, an acid vat to clean off any graphite that's on the surface. So we put this piece in, uh, left it over the weekend. They had spent years refining their technique, but so far, every attempt had failed. But checking in on that Monday morning, Robert Linares noticed something very odd. At first, it seemed that not only had the experiment failed, but the diamond had disappeared completely. He came in on Monday, and we didn't see the diamond there. We saw nothing. And then we looked further, and we noticed that the crystal was there. But it was perfectly transparent. It was perfectly colorless. It was like someone had pulled a hood off of our head and we could see the truth. And at that moment, we knew we had crossed a huge barrier and we could now make a very perfect diamond. Robert Linares had achieved something that had eluded science for centuries. He had made a gem quality diamond to rival the very best found in nature. A breakthrough so astonishing that it might revolutionize the multi-billion dollar diamond market. Diamonds are the ultimate statement of luxury. Glittering and sexy, they've never gone out of fashion. Even today, there are plenty of women who believe diamonds are a girl's best friend. Our job as marketers is not to make women want diamonds. I can tell you they want them before we start. Our job is just to help them to get them. Come and get me, boys. I've talked to enough women around the world about diamonds to know uh, what it is that they, that they dream about. Uh, they dream about owning a piece of eternity. What makes diamonds so special is that they sparkle like no other gemstone. It has that unique combination of life and brilliance and flash. It really makes you feel special when you're looking at it. Such is the allure of these rocks that people go to extraordinary lengths to get their hands on them. 
Good evening. Five men who tried to pull off the biggest robbery in history were jailed today for a total of 74 years. They tried to steal £200 million worth of diamonds on display at the Millennium Dome. They got as far as smashing a supposedly bomb-proof display case. But the flying squad knew all about the plot and they were waiting in ambush. One said, I was only 12 inches from payday. It would have been a blinding Christmas. Diamonds occur naturally in the ground, but digging them out is immensely difficult. With mines located in some of the world's most inhospitable places, it's a dangerous and very expensive business. You have to shift over 200 tonnes of rock for every carat of diamond. But ironically, diamonds, for all their fire and sparkle, are actually just a very hard version of an extremely common element. Diamond is nothing more than a lump of carbon. In nature, pure carbon is more readily found in a different form, as soft black graphite. You see, these structures couldn't be more different. You have graphite, which is a beautifully layered structure. It has layers of carbon atoms separated by very weak bonds. Now, within the layers, each carbon atom is beautifully coordinated to three other carbons. And that leads to very strong layers. But the bonding between the layers are exceptionally weak. But if that bonding is rearranged, something remarkable occurs. By contrast, diamond is the hardest material known. And it's hard because of the way it's bonded together this three-dimensional linkage in which every carbon atom is surrounded by four neighbors and it forms a complete three-dimensional structure. You know, a structure can only be as strong as its weakest direction. And in diamond, there are no weak directions. Every bond is almost as strong as a bond can be. The difference between the two forms of carbon is so subtle that scientists have searched for ways of transforming cheap graphite into much more valuable diamond. Synthesizing diamonds had been a holy grail for physicists, for chemists. For 200 years, people had tried to make diamonds and they had failed. That two centuries long quest began with a worldwide hunt for clues. The very first came from the way diamonds were formed in nature. It's believed that diamonds are created 200 kilometers beneath the Earth's surface and that they can take millions or even billions of years to form. It's then during rare and exceptionally violent volcanic eruptions that diamonds are blasted to the surface within a rock called kimberlite. Finding diamonds in kimberlite gave hints to how diamonds were formed. It told you you needed high temperature and high pressure because that's where the kimberlites came from, this volcanic rock from deep in the earth. The task facing would-be diamond makers was to mimic the vast pressures and savage temperatures found deep in the earth, and to do it not over millions of years, but in days. No one got close until the 1950s. Working in the greatest secrecy for the engineering company General Electric, a team of American scientists took up the challenge. They aimed to create diamond from graphite. GE spent millions of dollars developing a gigantic 400-ton diamond press. It produced pressures up to 60,000 atmospheres and temperatures topping 3,000 Celsius. But they were making little headway. So experiments were done on, on trying to convert graphite or carbon into diamond. Well. Going straight from graphite to diamond didn't, didn't work. For four years, all they got were broken presses. 
there was something missing in their chemistry. So they looked for new clues. In a meteorite crater in Arizona, diamonds had been discovered encased in a substance called troilite, or iron sulfide. These diamonds were formed by the high pressure and temperatures created during impact. The GE scientists believed that troilite might be the missing ingredient needed to convert graphite into diamond. So they had another go. It was a wintry day. It was cold, but the sun was shining through the window. And I had put some troilite in this graphite tube. I put it in my apparatus. I turned up my heating system. And I put the pressure on. The force builds up and up and up eventually reaching nearly 500 tons, almost one million pounds per square inch. The outer surfaces reach 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Inside, 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit. They could only risk running their machines for a few minutes, but they hoped it would be enough. Then, just as they'd done dozens of times before, they broke open the capsule. I got down to the point where I picked things apart and got to look at what's the, there in the middle. And uh, my eyes caught the gleam of the sun shining on these things. And I twirled it around a little bit and saw the sparkles. My knees weakened. I had to sit down. I, I was overwhelmed. And at that instant, I knew that man had finally turned graphite into diamond. There are headlines in all the newspapers around the world. Yeah, GE is making diamond now. Wow, it was just a very nice feeling that we had a tough problem and we had solved it. We had been challenged and we met the challenge and faced it and won. But for all this triumph, GE's diamonds were nowhere near good enough to adorn the neck of a movie star. Nevertheless, their grit-sized grains didn't go unnoticed in the boardroom of the most powerful diamond-producing cartel in the world. De Beers is the diamond industry, and it's dominated the market for well over 100 years. We'll sell in the neighborhood of $5 billion worth of rough diamonds. I would have thought a figure north of uh, 100 million uh, carats a year of total rough production somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of the world supply. From their headquarters in central London, De Beers Rough Diamonds are sorted and distributed around the world, sold to select dealers for cutting and polishing. For years, De Beers have maintained extraordinary levels of control on the $60 billion global diamond market. Initially, they didn't see the arrival of man-made diamonds as a threat. They were just too low quality, fit only for making industrial cutting tools. However, De Beers did see potential danger in the future if diamond-making technology improved. So, at a discreet facility on the outskirts of London, De Beers created the GEM Defensive Program. At vast cost, the new scientific division was set up to develop techniques to distinguish between natural 
and synthetic diamonds. Clearly we knew that someday synthetic gems would be made available in the consumer market. The crucial thing for us was to make sure that first the industry, but more importantly in the end the consumer, uh, had every means uh, possible to ensure we could detect uh, the, the, the stimulant from the genuine article. With their scientists busy working away, De Beers were confident they had time in hand to prepare for any future threats. But unknown to De Beers, a challenge already existed, hidden away behind the Iron Curtain. With the breakup of the Soviet Union, Russian scientists were keen to explore the new ideals of capitalism. In the early 90s, on the outskirts of Moscow, diamond scientist Dr. Boris Fiegelson set up a lab in rooms rented from the Institute of the Blind. I had hopes. I even had dreams about it. That was at the time when things started to happen. His original idea was to copy General Electric's theory of high pressure and high temperature. But instead of tiny grains, he planned to grow gem-sized diamonds. But he just didn't have the right gear. With little money, he had to use whatever equipment came to hand. His first attempts were wrought with danger. We had to select the right materials and the right parts for the press. Because if it was set up wrongly, then it was quite possible that there would be an explosion. Everything would come flying out at high pressure. In the end, in contrast to the giant machines used by General Electric, Fiegelson cobbled together a diamond press not much bigger than a washing machine. At its heart was a small spherical growth chamber which used a unique method to create the required high pressure. Pumping oil around the sphere created a moderate hydraulic pressure. This was then amplified through specially shaped steel anvils to create a massive 58,000 atmospheres down at the central core. But at first, he still wasn't getting the goods. When we thought we understood everything, everything was clear. Then something emerged, something no one predicted, and everything fell through. Fiegelson decided to try an old crystal growing trick and give his diamond a head start. Within the growth core, he added a tiny piece of low quality grit diamond. He hoped this would act as a seed on which the growing diamond could form. Above it was a metal solvent and a layer of graphite. He then applied an electric current to heat the top of the chamber. This dissolved the graphite into the metal solvent, releasing the carbon atoms. The carbon atoms migrated through the molten solvent to the cooler end of the capsule, where they crystallized onto the diamond seed, making it grow. We managed to get sometimes quite good crystals, but more often the results were not good. Fiegelson's diamonds had telltale signs which would betray their man-made origins. They often contained small fragments of metal. It was clear to us that we had to refine the chemistry and stabilize the heating process as much as possible. Fiegelson eventually discovered that by controlling the critical temperatures within the growth core in a very precise manner, he could dramatically improve the quality of his diamonds. His diamond growing technique was still not consistent, but Fiegelson had realized his dream. But there was something else about his diamonds, something that made them potentially of extraordinary value. His diamonds weren't crystal clear, 
they were coloured. When we got our first good crystal, we were naturally absolutely overwhelmed. Coloured diamonds are found in nature, but they're extremely rare. Among their number are the great legends of the diamond world, like the Hope Diamond, the Dresden Green, the Tiffany Yellow, and the recently unveiled Blue Empress. Fancy coloured diamonds are highly prized, and they're hideously expensive. Only the finest jewellers stock natural coloured diamonds. Jeremy Morris has been in the family business for 20 years. Wealthy people at the market for uh, vivid and fancy intense coloured diamonds. It's not for the average person, the prices are prohibitive. Unfortunately. <laughs> this stone here is, um, is a little freak of nature. It's a six carat, deep brownish orangey yellow, but that would be around $300,000. One carat 25, vivid orangey yellow, dazzlingly beautiful, 38,000 pounds. We have here a 25 carat light pink, one and a half million dollars, or near us offer. <laughs> the lucrative trade in fancy coloured diamonds was a market the Russian diamond makers were keen to exploit. It's possible to make duplicate hope diamonds, or red diamonds, or yellow diamonds, or green diamonds, all different sorts of colors of diamonds, just by controlling the right impurity, the slight change in the chemical mix that goes into making these diamonds. But if the diamond makers were going to stand any chance of selling their rocks, first they had to convince the diamond dealers of the West. Every year, Las Vegas hosts one of the world's largest gem fairs, where thousands of dealers sell their wares to jewelers from around the world. In 1999, coloured synthetic diamonds coming out of Russia were showcased here for the first time. Just today we had here at the show a large selection of synthetic diamonds presented and showed to us in a variety of fancy colours. You're talking about blue stones that look like $100,000 per carat stones. Very nice stones. Lured by the dream of fabulous wealth, diamond labs had sprung up all over Russia. As a middleman for synthetic diamonds, Alex Gryzenko had been drawn to Vegas. For the last several years, uh, we've been looking at what the potential market could actually be. Today, the market is truly in its infant, infant stage. And as demand grows, and demand has to grow, this market has to be created. And as demand grows, uh, so will supply, inevitably. It will be a big market. But back in 1999, the prospect of a world flooded by synthetic Russian diamonds actually seemed remote. Their labs lacked the funds and the necessary production skills. The Russians certainly have problems today. We, we all understand that. Uh, capital is scarce. Infrastructure is, uh, in some places, uh, complicated. Um, capital investments into Russia today are difficult. But a chance meeting was about to change all that. Like something out of a James Bond movie, a Russian scientist made a cautious approach to a former US Army general. It was to be a fateful encounter. I was in Moscow on another project uh, developing an electronic security device, and one of the scientists on the project asked me whether or not I was interested in diamonds. 
And I said, well, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm interested in most anything. And uh, frankly, I thought he was going to ask me to invest in some diamond mining project. But instead, they took me to a facility outside of Moscow, and they uh, showed me a machine that they claimed would make diamonds. General Carter Clark was intrigued. But even though he decided to fork out $170,000 for three units, he was quite skeptical that the Russian machines could make anything at all. The machines they had in Russia were doing experimental work, and there's a big gap between a laboratory type of operations and a commercial production. We really had to bring good old Yankee ingenuity uh, into being in order to uh, make this a viable business. So he brought the whole operation back to his native Florida. There, he set up shop as the Gemesis Corporation. His ultimate plan, to mass produce synthetic diamonds. But straight away, it was clear the Russian machines just weren't doing the business. They were able to get a crystal once in a while, but not all the time. They couldn't get the size we wanted. They couldn't get the color we wanted. Couldn't get the consistency we wanted. Couldn't get the yields we wanted. The whole idea of the, of the growth process had to be rethought. So General Clark enlisted the help of scientists from the University of Florida. Dr. Rob Chaduka identified the problem. Too much human intervention. When the machines initially came over, one of the, the large problems were they were manually operated. There was a person sitting in front of that machine 24 hours a day, seven days a week, while that machine was running, controlling the principal uh, properties for that machine to operate, the pressure and the temperature. We wanted to remove the human error associated with running and operating this machine so we could produce a product on a consistent basis. Uh, that was, we had to computer control it. The university scientists attempted to automate the growth process entirely. No one had tried this before, but eventually they managed to convert the machines. Using their updated design, Clark's technicians started building their own presses, ultimately creating the world's first gem diamond production line. Each of his 23 machines could then be prepared and loaded in minutes. Now, it was a simple case of pressing start and waiting for the machine to do in four. I'm gonna do this now. Oh my God. Power equivalent to a hairdryer running at the same time. After each machine finished its run, the growth cores were extracted. They were then cracked open to reveal a small lump of metal which contained the diamond. These were then each washed in acid baths to dissolve away the metal, revealing the newly formed rough diamond. Clark was finally on his way to achieving his goal. He was now producing fancy yellow diamonds far superior in size and quality to anything ever created in the Russian labs. Initially we were growing stones that were less than uh, two carats, roughly about 1.5, 1.6, 1.7 1 carats. Now we're growing uh, three to three and a half carats. And that'll cut and polish to a stone that's almost two carats, uh, depending on the cut that you want. We're also getting a better color. Before, we used to get a washed out yellow. Now we get a nice vivid or intense yellow. Until now, it had only been the uber rich who could afford natural colored diamonds. Clark dreamt of taking his colored diamonds out onto the high street. These diamonds from nature are very expensive. A one carat vivid yellow diamond would go somewhere between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars. Our comparable stone would go somewhere around four thousand dollars. Admittedly not for everyone's pocket, but high quality synthetic stones selling for a quarter of the price of naturals 
sent ripples across the diamond pond. For the first time, there was a real threat of synthetic, gem-quality diamonds flooding the market and undermining the traditional diamond trade. The concern in the industry today is what if, just what if, there is a way to synthesize diamonds that are non-detectable from natural diamonds? What if technology gives us the ability to make a synthetic diamond that no one knows is synthetic? This possibility was not lost on the world's largest diamond trading company, De Beers. Unless they could respond decisively, they might lose their dominance of the market. Their first tactic, simply dismiss the competition. Unless it came out of the ground, it just wasn't the real thing. Diamonds are so much more than just crystallized carbon. Diamonds are something from our from our deep, deep past, billions of years old, a miracle of nature. You can't replicate that uh, in a laboratory yesterday uh, in, in Florida. It's not possible. De Beers' gem defense program then sprang into action. Millions of dollars had been spent developing various machines to tell synthetics from the natural stones. The problem they faced was that synthetics were now very high quality. It forced them to study down to the diamond's atomic structure to detect even the tiniest differences. This instrument is Diamond Shore. It's our rapid screening instrument that's been designed to pass natural diamonds whilst at the same time referring all synthetic diamonds. Diamond Shore works by analyzing the way light is absorbed by a diamond. It's down to how nitrogen impurities form within the crystal. Nitrogen atoms occur in clumps in 98% of all natural diamonds. This causes light to be absorbed in a specific way and provides the key to their detection. This has got a pass result the user can be confident that this is a natural diamond and requires no further testing. I'm now going to place a yellow diamond onto the probe, press the test key, and this time, within a few seconds, it's come up with a different result. It said, refer for further tests. In yellow synthetic diamonds, nitrogen doesn't exist in clumps, but instead as single atoms dispersed throughout the crystal. This causes light to be absorbed differently, which is picked up by the machine. Any questionable stones then get transferred to De Beers' next line of defense, the diamond view machine. Diamond view shines ultraviolet light onto the diamond and generates a surface fluorescence image from which synthetics may be unambiguously identified. Under ultraviolet light, both natural and synthetic diamonds will glow to some degree. This is called fluorescence. But it's the patterns that are revealed by this glowing fluorescence that can tell the two apart. It's immediately obvious from the strong, blocky, uh, blue fluorescence patterns that this is a synthetic. You wouldn't get these strong shapes of blue fluorescence from a natural. Under the UV light, natural yellow diamonds look very different, producing a consistent yet very faint blue glow. With technology like this, De Beers feels it can outrightly dismiss the threat of synthetics. Today we can you know, easily detect uh, each and every synthetic uh, stone that's made. Uh, that's really important to maintain industry confidence. De Beers were able to prevent any lab-grown colored gems from being passed off as natural diamonds. No synthetics could trick their way into De Beers' multi-billion dollar industry. <laughs> But none of this phases General Clark. He's starting to make serious headway into creating his own industry for synthetic diamonds. 
The key to Clark's business plan is that he doesn't intend to compete against De Beers. We do not want our diamonds to be passed off as natural diamonds. That wouldn't do us any good, would not do the industry any good, and certainly would not do the consumer any good. So we're very strong in our concern about that, and we're taking every measure that we can to prevent that. All his diamonds are sent to the heart of the Diamond District in New York City, to the International Gemological Institute. Here, they are officially certified as being man-made. They're also subjected to a more invasive level of disclosure and have their origin tattooed on them by laser. General Clark's aim is to establish an entirely new market of affordable, colored, synthetic gems. Currently producing 200 diamonds a month, Clark has grand plans for massive expansion. We have 23 machines in this facility right now, uh, growing diamonds 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And what our ambition is, is to fill this whole environment here with about 250 machines in the not too distant future. Clark's plan would create an annual production of 25,000 high quality synthetic yellow diamonds. In the nearby town of Sarasota, on the west coast of Florida, his diamonds are already on sale. They're absolutely beautiful. You couldn't ask for more beautiful stones. It makes it for more uh, everyday people to be able to afford beautiful, fancy colored diamonds. It's too early to say if Clark's new market for colored synthetic diamonds will ever pose a serious financial threat to De Beers. His output at the moment is just too small. And anyway, for De Beers, it's the clear, colorless diamonds that are the main thrust of their global empire. And that market was completely unthreatened. Or so they thought. Shrouded in utmost secrecy, a company called Apollo Diamond has been operating somewhere outside Boston, Massachusetts, for the last two years. Highly protective of their technology, they have rarely granted access to their laboratory. Horizon was never given the address, just taken to their production facility. The company's founder, Dr. Robert Linares, had never intended to get into the diamond business. His interest had always been in semiconductors. Previous company was manufacturing uh, gallium arsenide wafers for very high frequency uh, devices such as cell phones and radars and at the time that was the ultimate semiconductor and uh, after I left that company I sold it and I wanted to go to the next highest performance semiconductor and that was going to be diamond diamond has some unique properties that make it a material with all sorts of possibilities for the high-tech industries it's the hardest material known to man. It has a highest velocity of sound, it has the highest thermal conductivity, and it has semiconductor properties which exceed that of silicon and other materials. The real thrust is to develop new single crystal diamond technology and to create the ability to grow large diamonds for semiconductor and optical application. But it was while striving to meet these goals that they stumbled upon something utterly unforeseen and ultimately much more glamorous. We're actually seeing diamonds now that really had the ability to become diamond gemstones. In their mission to make semiconductors, they had discovered how to make clear, colorless diamond. It was a eureka moment for uh, this company where we recognized that we could really do something tremendous in this $60 billion marketplace. The Linares adopted a completely different approach to other gem diamond makers, a technique called chemical vapor deposition, 
or CVD. Unlike previous methods of growing diamonds, it didn't need high pressure or graphite and was based on using two very common gases. CVD diamond is done at very low pressures, less than one atmosphere. And you introduce two gases. You introduce hydrogen and methane. But before the process could begin, what they needed was a seed for each new diamond to grow on. These seeds were made of thin slivers of low-grade diamond. In preparation for growth, they were sliced and shaped using a high-power laser. When we have the prepared seeds, we then load them into the machine. And what our process can do, is capable of doing is growing on multiple seeds at a time. We can load 25, 50 seeds at a time, and really how many seeds we put in depends on the size of the individual seeds. When the growth chamber was closed, the pressure was lowered and the seeds heated to around 800 Celsius. Hydrogen and methane were pumped into the chamber. Then, using high-power microwaves, the mixture was ignited forming a gas plasma. Within this chemical soup, highly reactive hydrogen atoms collided with the methane molecules, releasing carbon atoms. These atoms were then attracted down to bond with the carbon atoms of the diamond seeds. And so the new diamonds grew, atom by atom. But initially, there was a hitch. Others had tried CVD, but could only produce very thin wafers of diamond, nothing like the thickness needed to create a gemstone. It was commonly thought by scientists around the world that you could never make diamond by the CVD process that was greater than 15 microns thick. That's far less than the thickness of a hair. We discovered how to cross that barrier. And we discovered it for a couple of reasons, one of which was we had to, because we were basing our future business on making single crystal that was thick. And once we figured out how to do it, we very quickly went to a half a millimeter thick, one millimeter thick, three millimeters thick, five millimeters thick. To this day, Robert Linares has not revealed the secrets of his technique. But within his machine, he could now effectively watch three million years of diamond growth happening before his eyes. But there was something else. His diamonds had a clarity and structure unrivaled by any other synthetic process. The gem diamonds that we make here at Apollo are very perfect and they have the capability of being the most perfect diamonds that we've seen on the planet. The Naval Research Department here in the United States has called them the most perfect diamonds that they've ever seen, both man-made or natural. Finally, scientists were not just able to match nature, but make something even more perfect and available at a fraction of the cost. It was the first serious threat to the traditional market in clear diamonds. De Beers scientists were now facing their ultimate test. Never before had they come up against a cheap synthetic diamond that might be more brilliant than a natural one. If they couldn't detect these new colorless stones, then consumer confidence in their natural diamonds could take a hammering. Using their Diamond Sure device, the clear CVD diamond was recognized as an unusual stone, but it still required further tests. Okay, this is a colorless stone that has been referred by the Diamond Shore instrument. At this stage, we don't know whether it's synthetic or one of the rare types of natural diamond. So I'm going to place it into the stone holder and slide it into the sample chamber of diamond view. 
focus the visible image onto the table of the stone. And now I'm going to shine the ultraviolet lights onto the stone. This stone exhibits extremely intense orange fluorescence, which is a characteristic of uh, CVD diamond. Natural diamonds would typically show a blue fluorescence. De Beers are confident in the ability of their equipment to detect these new colourless diamonds and have sent their detection kit to gem labs around the world. But the question is, will that be enough to protect them in the long run? Typically, only diamonds above a certain size and quality are actually sent to labs for testing. The majority of us buy tiny diamonds from high street jewelers. And while they may be precious to us, diamonds so small are rarely sent to labs. The cost of testing them can be greater than their actual market value. As a result, the authenticity of small stones, once in the marketplace, may never be questioned. This is an entirely new challenge to De Beers. But they are adamant they will do anything to keep their market safe. Maintaining consumer confidence in diamonds uh, is worth any price that, uh, that the De Beers group needs to uh, spend to ensure it is there. You know, the diamond to a consumer is a precious thing. Uh, they want to buy it with confidence, they want to know what it is, and anything we can do to help that, we'll, we will do. But the fact is, high-quality synthetic diamonds now exist and have the same fire and brilliance as naturals. Driven by the likes of Gemesis and Apollo Diamond creating brand new markets, we now have the opportunity to buy synthetic diamonds. The only issue is whether you'd want to, or do you think a diamond is worth more if it comes out of the ground? The only problem you'd have with synthetic diamonds is they're not going to be as rare and they're not going to be as special. I mean, I could give you a Mona Lisa, there would be an exact copy of one, it would be fantastic. But the real thing is the real thing, and that brings out a very special feeling. You know, if an orchid is grown in the hot, steamy jungle in Central America, or it's grown in a hothouse in California, it's still an orchid, it's still very beautiful, women will love to have it, and they don't really care where it comes from. Where's the romance when you, when you have a, um, a yellow diamond and you give it to your loved one, you go, you go wow, that's amazing. And you, you go, yeah, you know, this is, this is a man-grown diamond. And it's like, well, why didn't you buy me a real one? <laughs> it's too soon to say if synthetic diamonds will catch on or if they'll undermine the trade in natural diamonds. But there's now a genuine chance that one day it could happen. On the hand may we quite continental, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. A kiss may be grand, but it's not the right Next week, Horizon investigates Tyrannosaurus Rex. Everyone knows it was the greatest hunter-killer of all time. But could we have got it completely wrong? Was T-Rex, in fact, a slow, lumbering scavenger? Or pear-shaped, these rocks don't lose their shape. Diamonds are a god.